Listen only mode. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining today's presentation hosted by the Sudden Arrhythmic Death Syndrome Foundation and Invite, entitled Latest Diagnostic and Treatment Strategies for Arrhythmogenic Right Ventricular Dysplasia or Cardiomyopathy. Before we begin, I would like to let you know that you, uh, the attendees, will have the opportunity to submit questions to our presenters today by typing them into the questions uh, pane of the control panel and uh, clicking uh, send or submit. Uh, you may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll collect them and address them during the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. I uh, want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded and will be available uh, for later viewing. With that, I, I would like to now introduce you to today's presenters, Dr. Hugh Calkins, who is uh, Professor of Cardiology and Director of the Electrophysiology Laboratory and Arrhythmia Service at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and Brittany Murray, who is the Clinical Genetic Counselor and Program Coordinator of the Johns Hopkins Hospital ARVDC program. Dr. Calkins and Ms. Murray, we thank you for your participation and have been looking forward to it, and I now turn it over to you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the SADS Foundation for putting on this uh, webinar on what we believe is a very important topic, which is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia or cardiomyopathy. So what we'd like to do over the next, I think, 40 minutes or so is, is to provide you with an overview on ARVD. Then we'll, uh, Brittany will update you on the genetic basis of the disease. I'll then uh, discuss the clinical presentation and follow up with these patients. We'll go over management and uh, wrap things up. So ARVD is a genetically determined cardiomyopathy which is characterized by progressive replacement of right ventricular myocardium by fatty and fibrotic tissue and clinically by ventricular arrhythmias that arise predominantly in the right ventricle. Uh, it's also now well recognized that there's a left dominant form of the disease and so some have proposed renaming the disease arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy but we prefer the term ARVD reflecting the fact that you know in the US version of this disease right right dominant disease is by far the most common manifestation of ARVD. Now this is a rare condition it's about one uh, per 5,000 in the United States a little bit more common in Italy it's equally common in men and women although men have a somewhat more uh, uh, more active course or at higher risk uh, ARVD counts for about sudden 5-20% of sudden deaths of young people in Italy and about 5% in the United States. Now to put this in context, as we all know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy occurs in about 1 in 500 individuals. So one could argue that this disease is one-tenth as important as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but that's obviously not the correct interpretation because if you actually look at the data, this is a recent study from the UK. Uh, where they looked at sudden cardiac death in sports and if you look at the deaths caused by you know ARVD shown in in orange 13 percent of these deaths compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in green you can see twice as many of these sudden deaths were caused by ARVD so although it's a far less common disease it's a far more lethal disease than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and I congratulate everyone for taking the time out to spend time on this call tonight now when you look at the history of the disease, the disease has been known to exist for hundreds of years, but it wasn't until 1982 when Frank Marcus went on a sabbatical in Paris with Guy Fontaine and put together this series of patients that ARVD really came to the, the forefront of uh, really received medical attention. So back in 1982, uh, 24 cases were described. These were pretty severe disease. Uh, and this was sort of a landmark publication that really launched the modern form of this disease. And here they used the term, you know, you know, right ventricular dysplasia. Now this was a very important paper, but there was one figure in this paper which was a little bit off, and that's this figure showing what's referred to as the triangle of dysplasia, the outflow tract to the right ventricle, the inflow tract to the right ventricle under the tricuspid valve in the RV apex and they were trying to highlight the fact that ARVD affected these three areas of the right ventricle. So they were correct that there is a triangle of RV dysplasia 
but it never involves the apex in early disease. So this leg of the triangle is in fact in the wrong place. And our research has shown that the true leg of the right of the third leg of this triangle is the posterior lateral LV. So ARVD affects the info tract of the right, ven right ventricle, the outflow tract, and the posterior lateral LV. And the apex is only involved in very severe disease when the entire right ventricle is affected. So, so, so it's important to notice that when, when someone's trying to read an MRI or whatever and the apex doesn't seem to be moved normally, that's not where ARVD you know, impacts the right ventricle. Now, when it comes to diagnosing ARVD, we now rely on the 2010 diagnostic criteria. Again, one of many, Frank Marcus's many contributions. And I think this was a sort of a, a, you know, a redo of the initial task force criteria that had been written by a task force led by Bill McKenna. Now, if you compare the 1994 criteria with the 2010 criteria, you know, you can notice some important changes. First, on the left side of the screen are all the different parameters you have to think about when you're evaluating someone for the for ARVD. What's the RV size and function? And did they get a biopsy? What did it show? Do they have T-wave inversions, V2 and V3? Do they have an epsilon wave? You know, and so forth. And here's the 1994 criteria. Here's the 2010 criteria. And suffice it to say that the 2010 criteria are more specific and they also put more emphasis on T-wave inversion in the right cordial leads. So a major criteria is, is T-wave inversions in V1 through V3, whereas uh, previously this was not a major criteria uh, and so forth. And they also, uh, anyhow, so I think it's, you know, it's important to be aware of this paper. If you're, if you're trying to diagnose this disease, pull out these tables and try to apply them as best as you can. In general, a major criteria gets you two points, a minor criteria gets you one point, and to get the diagnosis you need you know, four points, one major, two minor, or four minor, and so forth. Now here is an EKG of one of our patients with ARVD, and when you look at this EKG, you can instantly recognize that it's abnormal with this T-wave inversions that leads V1 to V3. And again, this is a major criteria for ARVD. But when you look closer at this EKG, you can also note that the S wave seemed to have a stutter step. Getting from the S wave back to the baseline takes quicker than usual. And this is a parameter we call terminal activation delay. If this is more than 55 milliseconds, that gets you one minor criteria for ARVD. It's a little bit like the signal average EKG without a signal average machine, uh, but that's important to, uh, to, to note. Now, shown in this slide are a series of EKGs of patients from, with ARVD showing leads V1, V2, and V3 from four different patients. And as you look at this EK, these EKGs, I want to have you ask yourself, is there an epsilon wave? And, and you know, I think one of the interesting things about the diagnostic criteria is one would think it would be very easy to identify is there an epsilon wave present. But as it turns out, it's very hard and there's very poor inter-reader variability, even among experts. So recently a study was done looking at this where they took EKGs from many patients with ARVD. They sent them out to experts or self-proclaimed experts in ARVD and said, is there an epsilon wave? And it was all over the map. So if you look at this EKG, one could argue, well, that's a very clear epsilon wave, major criteria. But if your criteria for epsilon wave is you look at simultaneous V1, V2, V3, you'd say, well, the QRS ends here, which means that epsilon wave is really not outside the QRS complex. It's within the QRS complex, so it's not a real epsilon wave, and neither is that. So you'd say there's no epsilon wave here, but many people would disagree. So anyhow, this is the group that was assembled to read all these EKGs, Guy Fontaine, Frank Marcus, uh, Carado, uh, Domenico Corrado, Richard Hauer. Uh, and Peter Platnoff led this effort, uh, Wojciech Zariba, and, and we ended up putting together a paper basically saying that the, the inter-reader variability in epsilon waves is so great, it's really not a helpful parameter. And when we went to our databases, we found that it didn't make any difference in diagnosis, that if someone has an epsilon wave, they have severe disease and they meet all the criteria without including the epsilon wave, so we basically have encouraged those evaluating patients not to include the epsilon wave as, as a, one of the points in the diagnostic criteria 
because uh, if it's early ARVD and you, you misinterpret the epsilon wave, you'll all of a sudden be halfway to the diagnosis, and, and that really would be a mistake in our experience. A few words in MRI. MRI is a great way to look at RV size and function and LV size and function. You can also look at gadolinium enhance, enhancement. You can see you know, aneurysm formation. You know, so it's a very good you know, diagnostic test, but it's also the most common reason for overdiagnosis or misdiagnosis of ARVD. And this is due to the fact that there's a lack of awareness of the diagnostic criteria for ARVD. Many people incorrectly believe that the MRI is the gold standard. And if you have, a, if you have evidence of ARVD in an MRI, that's all you need to make the diagnosis. And that's obviously a big mistake. You know, others you know, fail to recognize that myocardial fat or wall thinning on an MRI are not even included in the diagnostic criteria. And yet many misinterpret fat on MRI, uh, an MRI as meaning ARVD. That's a mistake. Also, fail recognition that all RV wall motion abnormalities may result from an RV free wall tether between the RV and the sternum, a pectus, or a moderator band. And then there's the problem of overdiagnosis of apical aneurysm. And as I noted before, that ARVD spares the apex unless you have severe RV involvement. So now I'm going to turn it over to Brittany, uh, who's our lead uh, genetic counselor at Hopkins in our cardiology and inherited heart disease clinic and the ARVD program, and, and she'll uh, take you through the genetics. Okay, so starting um, around a year 2004-2002, um, that there were some of the first papers came out really describing that ARVD is actually a disease of the cardiac desmosome. Um, and from there, after desmoplatin is identified and placoglobin as one of the most crucial parts of the desmosome and um, being involved in ARVD, um, other uh, desmosomal mutations were quickly um, identified as uh, also contributing to ARVD, including um, these studies, uh, this study about desmoglion um, and desmocolin, um, the other parts of the desmosomal complex that we uh, see today. So arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy is a disease of the cardiac desmosome. We most classically think about the desmosome as five genes really holding together the glue between the cells, or as I often say in clinic, the bolts between the heart cells holding the heart cells together. Uh, this is, again, showing an electron micrograph, really showing that in this intracellular mechanical junction between the cells, you have these complexes holding these connections together. Um, and uh, disruption of this complex and mutations in these genes can lead to disruption of this intracellular mechanical junction and all of the uh, features of ARVC that we see. So in the current hypotheses, which are continually evolving as we understand more and more about the mechanisms of ARVC, but in a most basic sense, we understand that ARVC is caused by desmosomal gene mutations that are inherited. They're present at the time of birth. However, we don't see ARVC in young children. It's over time due to a whole host of things, including mechanical stress exercise that Dr. Calkins will talk about later, um, that you see gap junction remodeling, desmosome, uh, remodeling, disruption of nuclear signaling, which leads to myocyte death, apoptosis, fibrogenesis and um, adipogenesis, which then leads to what we see as the fiber fatty replacement, wall thinning, and structural changes in the RV, uh, and the scar that can result in the ventricular arrhythmias, which are so common in our patients. So in the U.S., as Dr. Calkins says, placophilin 2 is the most common uh, genetic mutation in ARVC seen in the U.S., resulting in um, right-sided disease most commonly, although it can be biventricular and left-presenting. Um, just a quick notes about some other genes that have been seen on genetic te testing panels um, for ARVC in the past. Um, ryanidine receptor, RER2, we most classically understand as uh, being in, uh, responsible for causing CPVT. Uh, so we actually think that RYR2 mutations are not causative of ARVC, but rather uh, CPVT, you know, arrhythmias in, the, in a patient who may have been especially athletic can have a 
slightly dilated RV can lead to a phenocopy of ARVC but not true ARVC. Um, TGF beta um, has been reported but has never been seen by our clinic. clinic. Um, transmembrane protein 43 uh, is a founder mutation out of Newfoundland. It's very, very rare but it is a very highly penetrant and lethal uh, mutation when found. Um, we do see some uh, correlation with more than one mutation in one patient, so compound heterozygosity, um, uh, uh, leading to uh, more severe disease in some cases, which I'll talk about. Right now, on small sequencing panels that have been around for the last decade or so, um, the previously we would say we can find a mutation in an ARVC patient meeting diagnostic criteria in about half of those patients. So the sensitivity of genetic testing ARVC was always thought to be around 50%. So new data in 2016, now that we have larger arrhythmia panels, um, we went back and looked through our data, um, and we found you know, in our data that 40% uh, of those uh, sequenced on genetic testing would have had a mutation found on one of these small five to seven gene sequencing panels. But importantly, with the advent of these large sequencing panels, which include deletion duplication analysis and other genes, 7% uh, had a large deletion or duplication in the desmosomal genes, which would not have been picked up on sequencing. And 11 pathogenic mutations were found in non-desmosomal genes, uh, two in phospholambin, which is a known um, contributor to ARBC, especially in the Netherlands, lamin, a few in the sarcomere genes, SCN5A, which has an ever-expanding phenotype, and some other arrhythmia genes. What we think is really important is that four of these families had not only a pathogenic desmosomal variant, but also had another pathogenic variant and another cardiomyopathy gene. Um, so if you would have done sequencing alone of the small uh, five ARVC genes, you may have thought you found the answer, but we're missing another uh, disease gene segregating in the family. So typically here, uh, we use larger um, genetic testing panels um, when we're doing genetic testing. Uh, so we looked at our patient population and we tried to determine um, what is the impact of genotype on clinical course in ARVC um, and what do we see. So the most common type of mutation that we see, as we've said, is that most of our patients have a PKP2 mutation seen here in orange. In the United States, this is what we most commonly see. Um, but then we also see a lot of phospholambin, desmog desmoglian um, and some desmoplakin in our population as well. Most of the mutations that we find that are pathogenic and segregating in these families are premature truncating variants um, or splice site mutations. So it really would encourage a lot of caution with interpreting missense mutations in the desmosomes um, because they are very often um, uh, not, don't have enough proof for pathogenicity and may not segregate with the disease in a family. Most of the pathogenic variants we see are truncating. Um, so through this paper, we looked and said, okay, what are our main findings? So patients with mutations um, uh, are younger, and those presenting younger have sudden death and uh, uh, more severe arrhythmias rather than older patients. We also found that patients with more than one mutation had an earlier age of onset and an earlier occurrence of sustained BT compared to those with only one mutation. We also know that one of the strongest genotype-phenotype correlations that we see in ARVC is that LV dysfunction is very strongly related to genotype and is more common in patients with desmoplakin mutations and with non-desmosomal mutations, especially phospholambin. Therefore, in patients with these genotypes, we are much more aggressive with our heart failure management um, and heart failure medications. We also found that gender impacts phenotype. So while this is an autosomal dominant disease and the mutation can be passed on to men and women equally, present, presentation with sudden death was mainly in men, and men were more likely to be probands and more symptomatic at presentation. So on one hand, you could say that men may be exercising more, but in the U.S., we know that women often exercise just as much as men. So there's a lot of evidence that is currently coming about about the impact of testosterone in disease severity, and that it may lead to a more severe disease course in men than women. So now I'll have Dr. Calkins talk through a little bit of that clinical presentation and follow-up of our patients. Okay. <coughs> 
So let me start with this study, which we published uh, a fair number of years ago, but I think the message is the same now as it was then. So this was a series of 100 patients with ARVD, 69 of which were, were diagnosed while living and 31 on autopsy. And what you can appreciate is the average age of presentation was around 29. About half of them were high-level athletes, and they presented with either palpitations, syncope, or sudden death, and rarely were asymptomatic or picked up during some sort of screening test. So this is from that paper in 2005 showing a Kaplan-Meier curve, showing uh, uh, you know, freedom from symptoms, freedom from arrhythmias, and this is freedom from... Uh, uh, you know, this this is freedom from heart failure, and this is uh, you know you know live and mortality. Anyhow, the point of this slide is to is to make the point that the symptoms and the manifestations of ARVD don't show up till puberty. You can see it's not until around the age of 16 or 17 that we see our very first manifestations of ARVD, and this is really true today that we just don't see two-year-olds, five-year-olds. 10 year olds with ARVD, it's really the teenage years, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, where it begins to show up. And this slide makes the point that the symptoms correlate with arrhythmias and heart failure is a later uh, manifestation of the disease. Now, this is some data we put together on, on patients who ended up needing to get a, a heart transplant because of, uh, you know, because of ARVD. And uh, uh, each patient is shown as a line. So there's 18 different patients, and their age is shown here. And the line of the story of each patient is shown by a series of symbols. So until before they get diagnosed with ARVD, it's a dotted line. And when they get diagnosed with ARVD, it becomes a solid line. And then the heart failure stage is shown as a color code from black to red to blue to green to purple. And you know, events like VT events are shown by X's, defibrillator shocks by O's. Anyhow, the point of this slide is of the 18 patients who need a transplant, 61% were male, as Brittany pointed out. The symptom onset, they first presented around the age of 24, about 10 years earlier than the average patient. But they didn't need a transplant until about 16 years later, around the age of 40. You know, and the reason for transplant was heart failure in 13 and VT in 5. And increasingly with catheter ablation and other approach to control VT, I think it's becoming extremely rare to perform a transplant for VT, but rather it's really heart failure that's the, that, the, that is the reason to need that uh, transplant now. So let me go to the, hold on one second. Oh, hold on one second. Here we go. So recently we updated our experience with 1,001 patients and family members. Now this was a joint effort with Richard Howard's group in the Netherlands. Uh, and, 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 and what we found is uh, this shows the same kind of Kaplan-Meier curves of patients. These are, these are index patients with pathogenic mutations and those without an identifiable mutation viable mutation. And again, you can see the same relationship between age and symptoms is, is exists, rare before sort of 16 or 17. Symptoms correlate with arrhythmias and need for heart transplantation or death or late manifestations of the disease. You'll also notice that those that had a mutation presented at a younger age than those who didn't. So the mean age of presentation was 34 mutation carriers versus 38 in those without a mutation. Uh, so now let me move on to uh, management of this disease. And when you think about management of ARVD, we think about sort of a four-legged stool, or maybe we should consider it now a five-legged stool. You know, the first leg is to get the diagnosis right. That's obviously incredibly important. Once you made the diagnosis, then you have to decide, does this individual meet the, the risk needed to justify a defibrillator put, being put in? And then once you put a defibrillator in, you then need to manage symptoms, hopefully prevent the defibrillator from going off, and you also need to prevent progression. So these are really two legs. And then you have the important topic of, of family cascade uh, screening. So in terms of establishing an accurate diagnosis, we went over this earlier. I just want to emphasize that you have to do a comprehensive evaluation, including a history, including a family history, uh, exercise history, physical exam, EKG, signal average EKG, Holter echo, MRI, and stress test. 
And then gen ag testing is, is, is extremely important when the diagnosis is suspected. And then we apply the 2010 task force criteria. Now I want to call your attention to one rather new test that has been proposed by the group in Bordeaux, which is the high dose isoproteranol infusion test. So what they did is they took 412 patients with PVCs and, and possible ARVC and they gave them a 45 mics per minute of isoproteranol for three minutes, sort of an unbelievably high dose. And what they found is that patients with, with ARVD ended up having lots of arrhythmias. They had this positive response where you triggered reams of VT, frequent runs of non-sustained VT. This is sort of what they would see in ARVD patients. Now, we've been doing this test as well here at Hopkins, and we, and we have to admit that we see the same thing, that it really does seem to light up arrhythmias in patients with ARVD, I think making us all aware that these are oftentimes due to triggered activity or automaticity rather than just reentry. You know, but, but we've been using this test more as a risk stratifying tool that if you get these kinds of arrhythmias just with isoproteranol, you know, our, our early data suggests these are the high risk patients versus ones where it stays pretty quiet, but we're just still gathering data on that. Uh, let me just move on to risk stratification for, for ICD implantation. So when you think about variables for sudden cardiac death risk, you obviously think about a history of sudden death or sustained VT. Proband status, it turns out probands are at far higher risk than family members. The extent of disease is important, although we're all worried about that rare patient with very early disease who presents with a cardiac arrest and is almost, you know, a disease so, so mild you can't even see it. We really don't see that. PVC frequency on a Holter is extremely helpful. Cardiac syncope, exercise plans, results of EP testing and that isoproteranol infusion, and then importantly, patient preferences and values. Now, we were on a paper a number of years ago looking at 84 patients that had a primary prevention ICD. None of these patients have had sustained VT before. The average age was 31, about half were men. They were followed for five years. And, and, you know, and, we, and we wanted to look at predictors of appropriate therapies. So here's one figure from the paper making the point that an appropriate episode of VT occurred in nearly 60% of patients. So when we call it arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, it really is arrhythmogenic. I mean, these are a far higher rate of appropriate ICD shocks than in most studies for any other disease I'm aware of. And even when you say, well, I just want to look at stuff with a cycle length of 240 or shorter, it's still about a 25% you know, appropriate ICD therapy rate at about seven years of follow-up, really speaking to what high risk many of these patients are. And here are some of the predictors we looked at, the results of EP testing, separated those with or without appropriate therapy, PVC frequency, more than 1,000 PVCs in a Holter, non-sustained VT in a Holter was helpful, and look how, how powerful proband status was, that the family members were at much lower risk than the, than the probands, which sort of is counterintuitive. You'd say, my goodness, if the father had a cardiac arrest from ARVD, the son's got to have one, and that's exactly not the case, that there's no predictive ability in, you know, in that. So here's some more data on the relationship between PVC frequency and appropriate ICD therapy. So we broke it down into 20% ranges. So if you had less than 305 PVCs, almost no one had an appropriate therapy. More than 6,000, almost everyone had an appropriate therapy in a remarkably linear relationship. You know, I should say that we did another study showing that PVC frequency is pretty reproducible day to day in these patients. Uh, and here's the same thing with the Kaplan-Meier curve that based on the PVC frequency, a very, very strong, you know, and sort of linear predictive value. And then if you add the number of risk factors, are they a proband, do they have P how many PVCs, what's the results of EP testing, obviously the more risk factors you have, the higher, the higher uh, risk. So who should get a defibrillator? Clearly if someone has, has had sustained VT or VF, we'd recommend defibrillator implantation. If they're a proband and they meet task force criteria, uh, we generally would put defibrillators in those individuals. We're much more selective about family members. They've got to have high-risk features like non-sustained VT or severe disease or cardiac syncope. And then obviously, if someone's had a rhythmic syncope, uh, that's, uh, I think, an important uh, factor to consider. 
So let me uh, move on now to the issue of, uh, of uh, managing symptoms and preventing progression before we get on to the family screening piece. So I've shown here a results of a manuscript that we have in press in uh, JAMA Cardiology and that has not been published yet. It's been presented at a national meeting, but it's, it's been accepted for publication. And here we took, working with the Dutch, we took 80 patients with ARVD and we did an echo about five years apart on average. And we looked at what happened to RV uh, function and LV function, RV size, uh, and what we found, as you, I guess, would predict, is that over time, LV function decreased. I mean, RV function decreased quite significantly. LV function decreased. RV volumes and RV volumes went up. So for those of, of, of you or those who aren't on the call who think ARVD is not a progressive disease, I'd like to call your attention to what I think is a very important paper. I think it's consistent with what we have seen. But up until this point, there's been only small series. There's been nothing of this size or magnitude, making it very clear this is a progressive disease, and we have to take preventing progression seriously uh, in order to prevent heart failure and need for transplantation and other and other things. Uh, so how can we stop progressive, uh, progression? I think the most important by far is to stop exercising. I used to say think pack years of exercise, but it's not so much pack years of smoking. It's sort of chain smoking, and we'll go over that. Take beta blockers. I think beta blockers reduce arrhythmic risk, and I think based on heart failure studies, they probably help prevent progression. And same with ACE inhibitors, that we have a low threshold to use ACE inhibitors, particularly if there's evidence of a reduced either LV or RVEF. So, uh, 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 and then in terms of minimizing symptoms and defibrillator shocks, again, stop exercising, take beta blockers. We think the ACE inhibitors may be helpful. And then in select patients, we'll use antiarrhythmic drugs. And I think our, our first drug we typically will use is Sotolol, less commonly flecainide or Ticacin, and, and, and you know, fairly rarely amiodarone, but if someone doesn't want a catheterblation procedure and they failed Sotolol, that's not a bad option. And then obviously catheterblation plays you know, an important role. So let's go over the exercise story a little bit. So what data exists to support this recommendation to stop exercising. These are in patients who love to exercise. So we know that ARVD is a disease of the desmosome. We know desmosomes sort of glue cells together, and during exercise, RV pressures triple, and the RV dilates, so the wall stress goes up dramatically. We know that most ARVD patients, particularly those that present at young ages, are high-level athletes, usually starting vigorous exercise at six, seven, or eight. Exercise is a common trigger of arrhythmias and sudden death in these patients. And now there's probably been four or five mouse studies showing the provocative role of exercise in mouse models of ARVD. And there's been a number, I think actually four clinical studies to date, three from Hopkins, I mean two from Hopkins, three from Hopkins, one from Sweden, and one from the US ARVD study in patients showing the importance of this relationship. So let me just go over some of this data. This is our first uh, paper on this that uh, Cindy James put together. We looked at 87 patients that had a desmosomal mutation, and we took uh, lifetime exercise history in all these individuals and also classified them as to whether they're an endurance athlete or not. And what we found is that the number of hours per year of exercise uh, prior to pre presentation correlated with closely with whether in, the, in fact they met the task force criteria for ARVD. So in those individuals, again, each of whom had a desmosomal mutation, of those who exercised the most, 510 to 2,600 hours of exercise per year, 85% met diagnostic criteria, where only 28% of those that exercised less than 134 hours per year had evidence of ARVD. And similarly, if you just broke it down into endurance athlete, yes or no, you showed the same uh, relationship. Here's the uh, data showing the, the, just breaking it down into are they an, a competitive athlete or endurance athlete or not. Those that are an athlete had a much higher rate of, of VT and VF than those that, that were not an athlete. And similarly, when we look at heart failure, no heart failure in non-athletes and a lot of heart failure in athletes. So again, I think fairly compelling data. 
Now, recently we, we did some work looking at what, what the relationship is between exercise and patients with ARVD without a desmosomal mutation or identifiable desmosomal mutation. And what we found was quite striking that if in individuals with a mutation, so they have a desmosomal mutation, no family history, we'll say, but or a desmosome with a family history, it took on average 3,100 met hours of exercise prior to presentation to develop the disease or meet task force criteria. If you look at gene-elusive patients with ARVD without a family history, it took 6,700 met hours of exercise, so almost twice, sort of the double hit hypothesis that if you have a desmosomal mutation, it takes a lot less exercise to get ARVD than if you don't have uh, an identifiable mutation. So this just shows the, the, the schematic of this, you know, the genetic influences in blue, exercise influences on in white. If you have a mutation, you have a lot of genetic predisposition, doesn't take much exercise. Whereas if you don't have a mutation, you know, it, take, you have a, you know, you, it takes a lot more exercise to bring out an ARVD phenotype. We also did some work trying to figure out what's a safe exercise level. And to do this, we interviewed families that had PKP2 mutation, but I think a couple families will teach you a lot. So here's two families, each of whom there's a PKP mutation in each of these individuals. And their amount of exercise is shown in the vertical axis. This is cumulative met hours per year, so hours of exercise times intensity. And this is their age. So in this family, this is the proband. At the age of 10, this guy's exercising like a fiend. And by the age of whatever, 25, he's done 50,000 met hours of exercise. Gets ARVD, that's what the arrow means, has VT, and, and then he cuts down his exercise. Here's three siblings, all of whom exercise dramatically less, and none of whom developed VT, and only one of whom developed evidence of ARVD much later. And these are the AHA recommendations. I think they recommend 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise three or four times a week. So if you exercise less than what the AHA recommends to stay healthy, you seem to do fine. If, if you do it more, you have problems. Here's another family showing the same thing. Look at this, this individual started exercise at the age of 10, 90,000 met hours of exercise or 70,000 by the age of 15 when he got diagnosed with ARVD, had VT. Again, here's the siblings doing fine under this AHA you know, cut off. And this is just sort of cumulative data showing the same thing that I won't dwell on. A few comments about catheter ablation. Certainly I think that EP testing and a limited endocardial ablation procedure is appropriate at the time of initial evaluation or diagnosis. In a lot of these individuals, you know, one of the differential diagnoses is idiopathic RVOTVT. And certainly if you get in there, it behaves like RV, RVOTVT, it responds to ablation like RVOTVT, and everything looks fine. There's no need to be looking for weird things like ARVD. But if you induce, you know, three different morphologies of VT or have a positive isoproteranol infusion response, you've got to think a little more broadly. Uh, catheter ablation, you know, endo, Really, we do sort of combined endo epis recommended for patients receiving frequent ICD therapies despite drugs, or in, if a patient doesn't want to take antiarrhythmic drugs, you know, it's certainly reasonable to do a, a VT ablation experienced uh, center. So here's some of the data from our registry. Here's 87 patients uh, that got 175 VT ablation procedures, 2.3 per patient. Uh, 26 of these were epicardial, there were two major complications and these were followed for about six years. And you can see somewhat disappointing results. This is the epicardial ablation, endocardial ablation, and I think this was somewhat sobering. Again, this is in the registry with many centers performing the procedure. Uh, more recently, my colleague Harry Tandry, who leads this effort at Hopkins, published his data on 30 patients with ARVD performed at Johns Hopkins endo-epi procedures, uh, most had failed you know, drugs or prior ablation procedure, they were followed for about two years, and we now have about a 70% uh, success rate. I think more importantly is that there have been no complications. Right now, I think we are up to over 100 VT ablations, endo-epi VT ablations, and again, touch wood, no complications and uh, similar efficacy. So we're pleased by, by those results, and certainly we believe that VT ablation plays a role. This is just sort of the frequency of PVC of VT therapies pre and post ablation. So when even it, when it doesn't work completely, it, it improves quality of life. Okay, now I'm going to move on to Brittany, who will go over the uh, important issue of family screening.
So Dr. Hawkins and I often talk about that getting uh, the diagnosis correct in the proband is really only half the story because we know that ARVD, all ARVD is a genetic disease and so it's really important to um, continue cascade screening in the family and identify others who may be at risk. Uh, so we looked at this in our uh, registry um, and we looked through what, you know, what is the yield of serial evaluation in at-risk family members and we really looked through this study trying to identify what are the most helpful tests, what are the most useful tests, how does ARVD show up in family members and is family screening effective. Um, these were 117 relatives followed through our registry. Um, um, we followed them with ECG Holter, signal average, and MRI um, tests as per the task force criteria um, and then we looked for outcomes including disease progression, new task force criteria occurring during follow-up and occurrence of sustained VT or VF. Um, so the results of the baseline evaluation really saw um, that the biggest abnormalities that we saw uh, appearing were new electrical and new structural abnormalities. Um, the we do see that family members develop um, disease over time, but the thing that we saw changing first and what we believe is the most important testing uh, was the electrical progression preceded the structural progression. So ECG and Holter monitoring is very important in our screening that we follow our patients with here. So among the 74 patients who did not have um, uh, ARVD diagnosis at baseline, none of them experienced sustained VT or VF, um, but with the 43 individuals who uh, were asymptomatic but did meet diagnostic criteria at baseline, um, we had a percentage who did uh, experience sustained VT or VF in follow-up, but importantly, all of these individuals were properly diagnosed and managed uh, and had ICDs prior to their first VT and VF, so we do feel that uh, the screening protocol that we've developed is effective. So the summary of this paper was that ARVC relatives without a diagnosis at first evaluation have a good short-term prognosis, although um, you know certainly longer-term follow-up is needed. Um, and a, but a third of patients did experience disease progression during four years of follow-up. Uh, we find that electrical abnormalities precede detectable structural changes, and so we really focus a lot on ECG and Holter monitoring, and we space out our cardiac MRI follow-up. We really feel that cascade genetic testing is really important to identify those in the family that are at risk and target screening. Um, if you have a genetic mutation in a family that you're confident in, is that a real mutation with a lot of data behind it? As we continue to get larger and larger panels, we need to make sure that uh, the mutations we find are actually contributing to disease. But if you have a mutation that you're confident in, you can identify and um, continued following relatives only that carry the risk factor in the family. Also, outcomes in these patients are really impacted by genotype. Family members most likely to diagnose the di excuse me, family members most likely to develop the diagnosis of ARVC in this population were that were those that were had a mutation and were symptomatic. So this is important data on who to concentrate in on the family. So the Hopkins approach to screening family members, we start initial screening around 10 to 12 years of age. I usually say, you know, around the start of puberty, although we start as early as eight, depending on, um, you know, how athletic they may be hoping to be. Screening here involves the ECG and Holter and an MRI or electrocardiogram. Um, if it's done here at Hopkins, we'll do an MRI, but they have a tendency to be misread, so if it's done locally, we may just do an echo. The frequency of the substitute screening really depends on mutation status and exercise plans. We really encourage um, asymptomatic mutation carriers to avoid exercise because all the data that Dr. Hawkins presented, they may be able to avoid getting disease altogether, um, but if they feel strongly that they're gonna continue exercising because they don't have any evidence of disease, we're going to watch them much more carefully. Um, but in the absence of exercise, we generally repeat screening every two to three years. Um, however, if you're exercising, we obtain semi-annual ECG and Holters, um, and we generally really try to strongly encourage avoidance of exercise altogether. So Dr. Hawkins and I will wrap up here so we can have some time for your questions. Uh, as Dr. Hawkins said, ARVC is a rare but important cause of sudden death. Uh, it's a disease of desmosomal dysfunction.
the diagnosis is challenging and requires a comprehensive evaluation. Um, so being slow to make the diagnosis and being confident in your diagnosis is important. Uh, identification of genetic and clinical risk factors for sudden death remains an active area investigation and a big focus of our program in avoiding sudden death. Um, and to that end, we recommend ICD implantations for probands who meet test force criteria. Catheter ablation continues to play an important role in management, uh, and the data just continues to increase the vigorous exercise increases the chance of both developing ARVC and results in a greater chance of more VT and heart failure in these individuals. And we are pretty strong in our recommendation to advise against exercise. Um, obviously, we have a huge clinical program here at Hopkins, but we have a big registry as well. So we'd love to enroll any patients that you're following in our registry so we can continue to learn more. And then we will go ahead um, and pause for questions from there. Great. Uh, thank you, Brittany and Dr. Calkins, for that terrific presentation. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience that you're able to submit questions uh, by uh, entering them into the question pane and clicking Submit or Send. Uh, we've had some filter in, and uh, let's go ahead and start. Um, so what do you believe accounts for the 20% uh, versus 5% difference in sudden deaths associated with ARVC in Italy versus uh, the U.S.? Uh, they, I don't exactly know what that difference is. I think one of the differences in Italy, they have quite different uh, uh, distribution mutations than in the United States here. And in the Netherlands, PKP2 is by far the more, most common, whereas in Italy they have different uh, exercise. They also have, uh, uh, I say the 5% in the U.S., you know, is a sort of an old number. If you look at that study from the UK, where I think it was what twelve or sixteen percent, you know, it's it's probably so. I think the US is probably somewhat less, but I think it's probably because ARVD is a little bit more common in Italy, and they have different mutations. Thank you. In patients with ARVD, uh, do you see PVC VT morphology with left bundle branch block morphology and superior? The directed axis more often than PVC with inferior directed axis. Would you? Uh, I'd say, uh, I mean, so the significance, well, the significance of uh, your left bundle superior axis PVCs or VT you know, is much more specific for ARVD than left bundle inferior axis, which could just be triggered VT from the outflow tract. So the significance, I think, is is quite different for we have a lot more emphasis. If you see left bundle super axis PVCs, it's much more, you know, it's much more points to the diagnosis of ARVC. In terms of how often we free ACM, I think it's probably equal. About half the time they're superior axis and half the time inferior axis. Thank you. And I think that's consistent with the fact that both the inflow tract and the outflow tract, you know, are two legs, at legs of that triangle with the posterior lateral LV being the third leg. Speaking in the voice of the audience member, uh, did I hear correctly uh, you recommend ACE inhibitors for isolated RV dysfunction? Can you discuss the rationale and data, if any? Yeah. So the, there's no data. Uh, the, the rationale, at least from my simplistic way of thinking, is that we, you know, there's been countless studies showing that ACE inhibitors are helpful both for preventing progression of LV myopathy, both in terms of preventing progression and also a, a, causing regression. With ARVD, there's obviously no studies because it's such a rare disease that it's virtually impossible to do studies of that type. But I, th I think what's good for the LV has got to be good for the RV is my simplistic way of thinking. And it's about risk-benefit. You know, I think the risks of an ACE or ARB is close to zero. And if the benefit, and I think there's, there's some benefit exactly what that benefit is, I'm not sure. But, but given that we know that ARVD is clearly progressive, and we don't have specific therapies to stop progression other than exercise, you know, my, we, we have a low threshold to, you know, put, put ACE or ARBs in the water just because they're, they're good things, at least from my perspective. Great. Brittany mentioned that LV dysfunction is more common in patients with uh, desmoplakin and non-desmosomal mutations. Uh, do you treat these patients more aggressively, and if so, how? <laughs> 
We do. Um, so our patients with desmoplakin mutations, um, they tend to have earlier onset of left-sided disease, more severe structural disease overall, um, and tend to do a little bit worse. So yes, we follow them very closely. Um, we get more frequent imaging in these patients. Dr. Calkins just talked about ACEs and ARBs. We're much more likely to use ACEs and ARBs very aggressively and have them follow very closely by our heart failure colleagues with metabolic stress tests every year. Um, and we watch their um, function very closely compared to, for example, PKP2 ARVC, um, which patients generally stay pretty stable from a structural standpoint um, and we more focus on managing arrhythmia. So it uh, definitely directs how we're following these patients. Great. Thank you. Given the EXAC data and recent papers uh, discussing overcalls of Titan mutations, is it possible that the 5% that had digenic heterozygosity could be an overcall or miscall of the one of the genes and digenic rate is not that high? Uh, yes, that's it's always an evolving discussion um, about the actual pathogenicity of these mutations, which is why I really caution any providers um, interpreting these variants uh, to involve um, your genetic counselor in uh, ongoing studying these variants and their pathogenicity overall. Uh, we're continuing to learn more and more about Titan um, and the impact of that, but I think we also have to take the exact data with a little bit of a grain of thought. Um, because we know that all of these diseases have um, reduced penetrance. So present, present, um, presence of a mutation in exact at an extremely low frequency is not really leading to me to ruling that out as a possible pathogenic mutation. You know, I know that half of my patients with pathogenic truncating, you know, PKP2 mutations that I can see tracking in a family, and I know I have 16 families with that same mutation showing disease, you know, I know I'm going to look at half of those pedigrees and see a negative family history. Um, so we know that, you know, there's lots of people running around with these mutations who have no evidence of disease, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean no evidence of risk. Thank you. How common is sudden cardiac death the first manifestation of ARVC? Uh, uh, it's, it's rare, but it certainly occurs. I mean, if you look at the, the, our initial experience where we had uh, whatever, a quarter of the patients presented with sudden cardiac death, in about two-thirds of those individuals, it was the first manifestation of ARVD. And in one-third, they had prior symptoms with a fair number of them having syncope between two weeks and a year prior to sudden death and obviously that's the most terrible situation where someone has syncope, it's not appropriately worked out, they missed the diagnosis, the patient dies suddenly. So that continues to happen more frequently than it should just because of lack of awareness of, of ARVD. So I think it occurs and when it occurs these tend to be young people, mainly young men uh, you know, that they, they get this sort of sudden death as an initial presentation. And this just speaks to this really importance of family screening and cascade screening. I mean, it's a tragedy when, when you know, a second, we've had families where there's been two, three family members die, and, and by, by, by doing genetic testing, by identifying the mutation, by screening the family members, you know, very frequently family members are screened, have evidence of disease, we can intervene with exercise changes, get them off the sports teams and save their life. So this is, is really serious stuff and, and, and I know from a clinical perspective, genetic testing has really dramatically changed how we evaluate and manage these patients. Thank you. Uh, in a child identified through family screening, at what age do you restrict activity and to what extent, for example, school gym class? Um, so it depends on what they're doing in gym class. Generally, uh, gym class is a pretty um, small amount of time per day, and they may not be exercising vigorously that whole time, but I would encourage you know, everyone to talk to their physician about that in their specific family. Um, we generally um, start offering 
uh, genetic testing to identify those children at risk to parents, you know, around school age when they're making decisions uh, about sports. Um, and so we really try to start it from the beginning that, you know, these kids aren't in you know, soccer up until age 16 and then have to drop out. It's, you know, we start them in lower level activities and getting involved in piano and theater and other things so that this um, isn't something that's taken away from them. They've just grown up realizing um, that this is not the best thing for them given their um, genetic background. Thank you. Uh, how do you manage family members of a sudden death proband with pathology or autopsy diagnosis, but not, but not a genetic di diagnosis. So we really um, look hard at that autopsy diagnosis um, and try to make sure that that autopsy diagnosis of ARVC is correct. Dr. Calkins can probably comment on some of the work that we've done looking at autopsies done here in the U.S. So we try to be uh, very uh, um, exact at looking at that autopsy and making sure it's ARVC. Um, but if we're pretty confident in that diagnosis, then we follow uh, family members of that individual, same as we would follow um, family members of a mutation negative proband um, who's alive. So, you know, they all need screening. We don't have anything to rule people in or rule people out. Thanks. Uh, if a single mutation has been identified in a family, is it still advisable to get uh, baseline echocardiogram in family members who test negative for that familial mutation, considering that a second mutation could have been missed in the proband? I would say a baseline echocardiogram is not recommended because echocardiogram is pretty useless in the workup of ARVC. Um, however, a baseline electrocardiogram, yes, would be important just a baseline to make sure there isn't anything else. Um, and we are pretty conservative. We don't routinely follow negative family members. However, we do always um, hedge and let them know, you know, hey, look out for symptoms. If something else, uh, if you're symptomatic, if something comes up, we're always reserved the right to, you know, reevaluate you and revisit what's going on. But we don't routinely follow family members who are negative long term. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can ARVD patients have VT or VF with normal EKGs? Uh, yes, we've actually published a paper on uh, on sort of EKG negative ARVD. Very, very rare, uh, uh, but but certainly has occurred. And we we published a paper about four or five years ago in the series, maybe five patients. So it's it's rare, but but it, it certainly can occur. But in general. You know, if you're screening someone for the ARVD, you know, with each negative test, it becomes less likely. So if you do an EKG, it's normal. Well, that makes it unlikely. You get a hold of that's negative, then it's even more unlikely. You know, then you get an MRI that's negative, then it's, you know, completely unlikely. You know, that kind of thing. Thank you. And usually we see, usually we see electrical manifestations before structural manifestations. So. If we're screening, whether it's family members or whatever else that have a mutation, you know, the first things that we tend to see are the EKG changes and the PVCs before we see detectable MRI on the balance. Great. Uh, since there is uh, health value in exercise, how much exercise is allowed in gene-positive individuals? Well, our conclusion of our study, as you remember those slides, was that you know, the AHA recommended amount of exercise to stay healthy is remarkably little. It's like 20 minutes of moderate exercise four times a week. So it appears that if you exercise less than that, either at or under that level, that seems to be safe. But in general, we say if you have you have ARVD or if you're at risk for ARVD, certainly no competitive athletics, no endurance athletics, and you really should be doing light to moderate exercise on an infrequent basis, meaning you can walk, you can play golf, you can go for a stroll, but you shouldn't be, you should be canceling your membership to the health club. Thank you. Uh, are there any drugs that ARVC patients should avoid, like QT prolonging drugs? Uh, I would say no. There's no, certainly Sotolol is a common antiarrhythmic drug that we see and we virtually never see evidence of proarrhythmia. So I'd say there's no, 
I mean, you know, you know, the question always becomes with stimulants. You know, we know that high-dose isoprotanol can really light up patients with ARVD. So catecholamines in general are not good, and that's one of the reasons that we put every patient on beta blockers with ARVD. And I think that's really important. So I think, but, but do we tell patients they can't drink coffee or they can't have a, have a glass of wine or whatever? No, I, I think there's, there's, there's not many other restrictions, but, but, but you know, high level, you know, you know, massive levels of alcohol are obviously never any good for anybody. Cocaine, things like that are obviously not recommended. Brittany, any thoughts? No cocaine. No cocaine. <laughs> Great. We all learned something. Um, so uh, uh, we've reached the end of our hour, and I'd like to start by thanking our, our audience uh, for their, their participation and submitting uh, many questions. We were not able to get to all of them, but we'll make an effort to circle back uh, to our presenters and, and, and do our best to get you uh, answers. Um, on behalf of the SADS Foundation, uh, Invitae, um, as well as our audience, uh, Dr. Calkins and Brittany, I'd really like to thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to, to share your knowledge and providing us with such a, an enlightening and interesting presentation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And it was wonderful. I appreciate everyone taking the time to learn about a very important condition. Thank you. All right. Goodbye.